Hello and welcome to the Common Bridge. We have arguably the most important topic that we've ever covered, and that is voting right and voting freedoms. Now, if you're listening to our partisan talking point tribal reporting, you think what we've got is a battle between voter fraud and voter suppression. Some might think that one side wants to set uh, and excuses why they are going to lose the future elections, and the other one is coming up also with their list of excuses. There's legislation at the federal level, in particular, the uh, HR1, S1, called the For the People Act. There's the VRRA, uh, and also just today, the Freedom to Vote Act. And in the state houses, there are many voter regulation bills that are being touted and being captioned as voter suppression or voter restriction. Now, I'll take note that not much of the news reporting or indeed a lot of the political commentary ever says anything about what's actually in the legislation, what the history has been, if there is a problem that's trying to be addressed, or are we just kind of slowly moving toward the future? Fortunately, we have as our guest today, as you heard his introduction, Professor Derek Muller of the University of Iowa. Uh, Professor Muller, it's my honor to welcome you to the Common Bridge. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Um, our guests, uh, our audience likes to know a little bit about our guests. Uh, you know, where were your early days like? Where'd you grow up? And what was some of your academic preparation? And uh, and maybe some of the highlights of your professional arc. Sure. So I grew up outside of Detroit in Royal Oak, Michigan, uh, and then went to Hillsdale College for undergrad and Notre Dame Law for law school. Um, and, you know, after that, I uh, practiced for a few years as a, a clerk for a federal judge in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and then I practiced a law firm called Kirkland & Ellis, a large law firm in Chicago doing litigation work. Um, and then after that, I started my academic career. I went to Penn State for a year uh, as a visitor and then spent nine years at Pepperdine in California. Uh, and this is my second year now out here uh, at the University of Iowa. Uh, my research is election law. I think a lot about how states go about administering federal elections, uh, federalism concerns. But I think about presidential elections. I think about redistricting. I think about campaign finance and the Voting Rights Act. Uh, you know, a little bit of everything when I talk about election law, but I also teach a variety of litigation classes from civil procedure to evidence to federal courts. Well, that's, I think, an important place to start, just the foundation. And what does the Constitution say about elections and who controls them? And uh, it, sometimes it seemed certain states were kind of on a watch list that the feds had to approve. So can you maybe just educate our audience on what the Constitution says and maybe where do we stand today? Yeah, so surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, we think about the Constitution and maybe we spend a lot of time on things like the First Amendment and the Second Amendment, right? The Constitution has a lot of details about how the government is formed and how members are elected to serve in that government, in addition to the fact that many of the amendments to the Constitution after the Bill of Rights relate specifically to the right to vote or rules and regulations about how the government operates. Um, so I think it, it, there are a host of areas of the Constitution we can think about, but I'll focus on a couple in particular. Um, and the things I think that are under debate as Congress thinks about regulating some of these uh, you know, election mechanisms. Uh, the first is that the, the states are sort of the default entity to administer elections. And the thought is they are going to be in charge of running congressional elections. And you think about that, it seems a little bit strange in one sense, right? When you think about the federal government, uh, we think about it sort of affecting everybody and especially a presidential election, a very national in scope. But the thought was that the states would be the default place to determine how to administer elections. But Congress has the power to step in for congressional elections and regulate the times, places, and manner of holding elections. So it has that residual authority. It's actually been, uh, I would say, for the most part, relatively reluctant to use that authority in the past. It has done so with some overseas and, and non-citizen, or I shouldn't say non-citizen, uniformed and overseas personnel, those voters who can vote by absentee, 
Uh, it's updated some voter registration forms, motor voter in the 90s. So there are a handful of times where Congress has done that. But for the most part, most election laws are still administered at the state level and certainly for state elections. But that did change, um, you know, especially after the Civil War, um, as we begin to expand the right to vote, expand enfranchisement, where the Constitution now guarantees in the 15th Amendment that the right to vote should not be denied or abridged on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. It extends to, to women, to uh, not paying a poll tax, to those over the age of 18. And so we've actually codified in the Constitution a number of places to ensure that there are voting rights for more and more people in the United States. And Congress has sometimes used its authority, um, you know, especially after the Civil War, to enact laws like the Voting Rights Act and some others that would help protect the right to vote for uh, all Americans, regardless of race, for instance, and thinking about ways that Congress could step in to enforce those guarantees in the Constitution. So most of the debates today, I think, that we're having about the congressional role or appropriate role um, are under sort of those two places in the Constitution. And a lot of the other things the states are doing, you know, either they have kind of outright authority to do in state elections, or they're sort of doing it because Congress has not acted. Yeah, and, and I know that we've heard about things like literacy tests and poll taxes and then uh, blocking of polling places. Um, what else? And, and have those things be, been remedied? And do we have evidence today of, of voter suppression that's going on yet in 2021? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it, 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 it's a, it's a loaded question <laughs> to put it that way when we use a phrase like voter suppression, right? But let me start with this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say um, it is easier to vote in the United States today than it has ever been in American history. Um, and I want to start with that baseline. I think there are a lot of important discussions happening right now about what the right to vote ought to look like. But to put it in a historical perspective, as you pointed out, um, there were literacy tests, there were poll taxes, there were, um, you know, a uh, pretty limited opportunities to register to vote in some places, or, you know, the old voter registration required you to register two weeks before every election. So there were a lot of things that were pretty fixed and restricted when we think about voting, not even not even the people who are eligible to vote, but to think about the mechanisms. Um, nowadays, I just think about the sheer breadth of opportunities to vote. We can take election day on its own. Um, you know, all states have some form of absentee voting, vote by mail. Um, in some places, they even mail you the ballot without even you requesting it if you're a registered voter. Um, in other places, there's no excuse absentee voting. And in other places, the excuses are pretty minimal, which is I'm not going to be in my polling place on Election Day. Um, in the last 20 years, states have developed early voting sites, early in-person voting, which is kind of a, the merger of the security of in-person voting with the convenience of absentee voting. Uh, we have extended opportunities to drop off ballots at, at the county or drop them in the mail. Some states have extended the deadlines of, of absentee voting for, for months in advance of the election. Um, so I think about all these things as sort of many, many rich, robust opportunities to participate in the political process. Um, so I think about that in a historical perspective. And in my judgment, a lot of things that we're fighting about um, are, are pretty much at the margins as we're thinking about, you know, should we be tweaking early voting days, the length of hours that, that, that the poll places are open, how long the absentee ballots are being mailed out? I mean, when you think about the many, many opportunities, there's no question that some of the laws that are being disputed today do, do trim some opportunities. And the question is how we sort of place those changes in the greater scheme of things. That's, I, I look forward to, to that part of our interview today. And, and let's take the other thing that's been in the news, um, voter fraud. Uh, now, in general, uh, we'll get to 2020 in a, in a bit, but historically, has the United States, and particularly in congressional or presidential elections, um, had voter fraud? Um, how would we know if there has been and or if or not, and how they've been investigated, and what's been discovered over the years. Sure. So voter fraud was more common in the United States in previous eras um, for, for, for various historical reasons. Um, you know, uh, in the 19th century, it was because polling, uh, you know, states didn't 
print their own ballots and administer their own ballots, which you, you're familiar with the phrase stuffing the ballot box. <laughs> People oh, yeah. could show up with their own ballots, act like they're putting one in and putting 10 in. So oh. the, the arrival of the Australian ballot, as we call it, which was developed in Australia, where the state prints and administers the ballot and hands out one per voter, greatly reduced fraud. Um, and then you had some political machines in the early 20th century. And even, you know, you talk about the, you know, the, the biography of Lyndon Johnson, among others, in Texas in the 40s and 50s. You know, th- there were certainly sort of political machines that would, um, wh- whether it's bribery, uh, whether it's um, impersonating other voters and showing at the, p- the polling places. Um, you know, there were some elections that had such problems in the past. Um, Today, it it just becomes more and more difficult um, to commit fraud. One is the sheer scale. Um, The United States is much, much larger now. (laughs) There are so many people here. The the size of Congress has not increased in 100 years. And so you have, you know, 10 to 15 times the voters in a single district. Um, And it's the same. The same is true in many other elections. So the sheer volume of votes you have to, to manipulate to change an election is really difficult to accomplish. It doesn't say it hasn't been done occasionally. So in 2018, there was a congressional election in North Carolina um, that turned on a couple hundred votes that um, you know a political operative had essentially been paid um, to help fraudulently uh, solicit and complete absentee ba- ballot forms. Um, usually these, these uh, voter fraud instances happen in local elections where it's a small number of people and it's easy to sort of intimidate or try to, to impersonate a handful of voters. But, but, but at scale, is what I describe, right, trying to get to hundreds and thousands of votes, it becomes very difficult. And especially, yeah, and, oh, go on. You know, in, the, in this time where, uh, you know, we're identified if we want to buy Sudafed or spray paint or, you know, even today to go into a restaurant in cities. Uh, and this morning, uh, uh, by my, one of my favorite charities where we drop off things, it said, don't come in unless you can prove uh, that you've had a vaccine. So we're getting past that era where someone can misrepresent themselves and if you think about the famous hijacker, parachutist, D.B. Cooper, you know, we never know for sure who the guy was. Well, today he wouldn't be on the plane with honest knowing, you right. know, exactly who he is. So let's move ahead to 2020. Um, there were claims of election fraud that actually started way before the election. Uh, there were suits brought. Uh, they were all shot down in court, I believe universally. I don't believe any are going. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And then the um, attorneys were sanctioned, which uh, is a fairly rare and extreme measure for the courts to take to tell the attorneys you filed something that, that wasn't true. Is there more to this story was, or was this whole you know, stolen election thing just a sham? Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think we can think about this in different ways. So before the election, there were a lot of concerns about, I'll use the term irregularities, right? <laughs> or there are concerns about, you know, that that, in, that a jurisdiction was changing its rules late in the game. And, and for mm-hmm. proponents of it, they would say, it's a pandemic. The, the, the ground is changing. We want to provide as many opportunities for voters to cast their votes in a safe and effective manner. And for those challenging it, they would say, well, look, you can't just change the rules if you don't have the authority to do so, or you shouldn't be doing them so late in the process. Or Secretary of State, the legislature said one thing, you can't say another. And so those cases were kind of mixed in how they were litigated. And then immediately after the election, I would say there's sort of two phases, and they sort of bled from one to the other. The first is some questions about recounts and wondering, or or even counting the ballots in the first place, suspicion about the count, because It took a while for some jurisdictions that had a deluge of mail-in ballots and that weren't allowed to start counting until election day. They had to rip open all these ballots and make all these signature comparisons. A lot of people were very skeptical of those things. So there was litigation, especially those first few days, I I think largely good faith litigation from people saying, what's going on? Um, And they lost, but, but those lawyers weren't sanctioned. What happened is later in the month of November into December, people began to file lawsuits with increasingly 
wild theories. So the most prominent being that certain voting machine systems flipped votes from one candidate to right. another. And in most of these states, there's paper ballots, right? We can go back and verify Georgia did a full statewide audit, for instance, of all of the paper ballots it had. So we know, you know, demonstrably in Georgia, among other places, that there weren't machines just flipping votes. But when you make those allegations without some support behind it, you know, lawyers have a duty of candor. And in the couple of days after the election, they had a very limited time to investigate claims. Courts are going to be a little bit more forgiving. When you've had four, six, eight weeks and you say, I have the proof and you don't show it, courts are going to be much less forgiving. And that's where the sanctions are coming in. Yeah. And, you know, I wish that we had better reporting uh, because it would seem to me that, you know, someone said, for example, in Philadelphia, yeah, yeah there were a lot of ballots that looked like they came in late, but here's why. Uh, or you and I share the home state of uh, Michigan and that, you know, oh, look at Detroit's ballots came in late. Well, they always come in late. They <laughs> collect their 463 precincts. And it's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Michigan cannot begin counting the absentee ballots until after the in-person election. And if memory serves me correctly, there were times they said, not even any, make any sense to open the absentee ballots because we have 5,000 ballots and the winner won by 50,000. So, well, so on the last point, uh, you know, every jurisdiction does count every ballot, even if it's, you know, even if it's a very wide margin, they want to make sure they have an accurate assessment for a variety of factors, reporting to the federal government for future Voting Rights Act claims, among other things. So, so that certainly happens. But you're right, Michigan and many states have laws that don't allow you to open absentee ballots until very late in the game. And in Michigan, they amended it recently to allow, I think maybe the day before, or two days, I'm going to have the timing off on that. But there, there was a trade-off, actually. There was a very specific fight in Michigan that's an interesting conversation to have. Michigan is also one of a handful of states that allows you to change your absentee vote up until the weekend before the election. If you drop off your ballot or you mail it in, and you can show up at the poll, you can show up at the county, you know, two, three weeks later, or the city, I guess, the way it's administered in Michigan, you show up at the city two, three weeks later, hey, I, I actually want to vote for somebody else. You know, I, th- this candidate said something that really offends me. I want to change my ballot. And they'll let you. They'll go in the system. They'll cancel it. Say, don't, when that, when that barcode comes through from the absentee ballot, don't count it. They'll give you a new ballot and you can count a new ballot. So it's a way of allowing you to change your mind very late in the process. The downside is, you know, Florida starts opening ballots two weeks ahead of the election and starts processing them. And by 11 o'clock on election night, almost the whole state is counted. In Michigan, as you point out, they're just starting to open the ballots and it takes a very, very long time, especially absentee. Yeah, I think some states started saying they could open the ballots, they could load them into the system, but not release the tabulation so as not to affect the, the, the remaining voting period, but it, right. it was there. Yes. And, and to your point about the allegations of uh, the machines not working, uh, there were people on the fringes saying, oh, look at Antrim County, which is about 6,600 um, uh, votes. And, and as a true Michigander, I'll say it's up there, you know? <laughs> yep, <right>? yep. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, uh, and, and they, they had just not loaded a parameter file correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and once they realized that 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 was the case, they made the correction. It was done in, in hours, but that became a central talking point yeah. um, from the Trump camp and from the far right. Yeah, it was a very. I mean, it's very unfortunate that you have an error like that. And it's you know, this is the thing. There, there is so we we have such a sophisticated system now. But the problem with a very sophisticated system is so many pieces, one small thing can go wrong and screw it up. So yeah, they had changed the alignment of the ballot in Antrim County in a couple of places for some of the down ballot races. And that just totally misaligned the machine as it was counting the ballots. And so you needed to tell the machine, you know, when you see a black bubble here, you count it for Trump and the black bubble here is counted for Biden, right? And it was just that mistake. And that tiny little mistake made late in the day resulted in the problem. And absolutely, you know, the the Secretary of State went back. They did a hand count of the entire county to make sure that the paper ballots all matched what the election day total was. And they found a couple of differences because the human eye observes things a little bit differently than the ballot. But it was a total, I think, a a difference of 12 votes among uh, among the entire county. But you're right that it sowed immense distrust in the election process after those results were changed on election night. 
So, so before we move into some of the state reactions, are there any known problems or suspicions uh, about the 2020 vote that are still lingering out there? This is someplace, I mean, you devote your career to this. Is there anything <laughs> that we need to be worried about at this point? Yeah, so I wouldn't say there's anything that we need to be worried about. Um, that is, there's nothing that I'm looking at from Election Day um, that hasn't been thoroughly investigated to say, oh, this is like a systemic problem that we need to think about in the future. Undoubtedly, there's the same kinds of things we talk about over and over, which is, you know, we like to have paper ballots. And there are a handful of jurisdictions, you know, especially for voters with disabilities that have some systems that are electronic only. And we want to have more of a paper trail, right? But that, that's something that's been happening in the United States forever. Or you think about absentee voting, you know, the processing issues you identify, but also, you know, signature matching is a very 19th century art, shall we say, where, yeah, where you know, at when best, you, at best. Yeah, when you sign off on the ballot, you know, or when you sign in for your voter registration, you probably aren't thinking, I'm creating a record that in the future will be used as the, checking my signature. And so it's a very imperfect system that requires, you know, these subjective election judges to make these assessments. And so some states, we can talk about this, you know, states like Georgia are saying, well, let's move toward using the last four digits of your social security number or your driver's license number. That's going to be the ID check instead of signatures. But, but, but there's nothing I would say that came out of 2020 that I would say, oh, it absolutely dramatically has to change because there was this fault in the system. Yeah. And, and I know that uh, our former president uh, really, you know, I think deliberately tried to shake people's confidence and um, had the Justice Department involved. And I think they stayed within their boundaries. And, you know, the way that Attorney General Barr summed it up, it's all bullshit. Um, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's done a great disservice. Um, but states have reacted and they've revisited their voting laws and procedures. And, the, you know, part of that is, you know, in results, okay, well, as your, to your earlier point, things got loosened up because of the pandemic and now right. what needs to be codified uh, into law. Um, do, is there a number, like how many states have made adjustments to their voting laws since the 2020 elections? Yeah, I mean, so there's definitely, I mean, most states have uh, enacted some legal change. Um, you know, I, I would put it in hundreds of laws. But most of them, I think, are either what you would say are innocuous or bipartisan or sort of consensus driven measures, um, you know, because after every election, um, you know, a lot of legislatures only meet part time and they meet, you know, in early odd numbered years. So they have a limited window of time to accomplish these things. So some are codifying things, changes they made during the pandemic. Others are, are um, you know, making some changes about things they didn't like about the pandemic. Others are just developing laws that have long since been on the books, uh, you know, that, or, or that they've considered in previous sessions. Um, so, so a number of states have done it. The question is, you know, I think you know, as we're leading up to, you know, what are those laws that are, are problematic, that are really causing concerns? What's in them as opposed to just trying to, to spit out a number to say, you know, 18 states have enacted 30 voter suppression laws or other kinds of unhelpful overall metrics? Yeah, and, see, and that's the thing that, that really frustrates me. And I think it frustrates a lot of people is that uh, you hear reporting saying the talking points of these are voter restriction laws, voter suppression laws. And I asked the question, really, what's in it? Like, give cite one part of one bill that you're so against or so in favor of, and, and people just don't. And that, I think, reflects the thing that we're trying to combat on the Common Bridge, which is the increasing tribalism. It's, we're just going to repeat the points that my guy said, or my side said, and the you know news reporting, that's their business model now. Um, I know it's hard to, to really tease out motivation, but as you've looked at some of these changes, do you have a view whether the changes were meant to deny citizens or groups of citizens specifically the right to vote or to make it more difficult, or is it just preventing cheating, or is it just modernizing? You know, did like did any states reduce their absentee voting or their ID requirements? Like okay, we're, we used to ask for your ID, now we're not going to. Or, um, you know, we, we used to say you could vote absentee with no excuse, now we're going to have to 
you, you have to give us a reason. Is any like what went on actually? Yeah. So I mean, so I w- I would say that there are a handful of states that did a little bit more to to trim back or make make certain voting opportunities more difficult. Um. So I would so I come from Iowa, so I can think about this. So absentee voting, you used to be able to submit your your request for absentee bo- voting. I, I think it was 120 days ahead of the election. Now it's 70 days. So that, that's that's a little bit of an inconvenience if you like to get it out there early. They used to mail absentee ballots uh, 27 days before the election. Now it's closer to 20 days before the election. You used to be able to, to mail the ballot all the way up until election day. Now it has to be received some period of time. Uh, or, or it used to be able to come in after election day. Now it has to come in by election day. It used to be that you could request an absentee ballot up until three days before the election. Now it's about 10 days before the election. So in all those things, they're trimming back on some of the absentee opportunities. Undoubtedly, you still have opportunities to vote in person, although they trimmed that that back from about 27 days to about three weeks. Um, You could still vote on election day, although they cut election day voting from uh, 14 hours to 13 hours. Now, what I think proponents of the law would say is, look, we had so many opportunities uh, we, we had 14 hours of election day voting. That was the outlier. Most states have 12 or 13 hours, and no right. one comes in that last hour. <laughs> I've worked the polls. Nine to 10, eight to nine p.m. is the graveyard shift, right? So we're going to trim that up. We want to sort of firm up the absentee voting, and we actually think it's a bad thing if you request an absentee ballot three days before the election. Odds are it might not get to you in time or get back in time. So, and maybe you know this is I think a, a sticking point between Republicans and Democrats. Um, Republicans really have a, a mentality of we should all vote on election day at the same time in the most secure manner so we all have the same information. And many Democrats think, well, why not provide as many opportunities as possible over a long period of time, even if we have different pieces of information, because it gives the opportunity to participate to more people and more flexibility. And so in a way, there's, I think, genuine disputes about what the best way forward is in administering these elections. Yeah, and, and look, that's, I think, again, that divide there, I think, speaks to this tribalism, you know, which I abhor, red versus blue. Um, if I'm going to vote, you know, before an election, why not just permanently mark me? I'm going to always vote for this party instead of I'm going to weigh what the issues are, weigh what the positions of the parties and the candidates are, and on that day, go in and make that vote. Um, you know, that's my concern is that, you know, the earlier and earlier it gets, um, the less and less real choice there is versus picking your team. And, and that's what I think has brought us to the precipice of a civil war. Now, yeah, now there's been I mean, some group. Oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, well, no, I think there's a couple things off of that, but, and then we'll, we'll move on. The, the one is, I think it, there is so much early voting and our, things like our, our, our um, presidential debates have not caught up with that, right? A lot of presidential debates happen when half the country has already voted <laughs> very late in the process. So it does sort of suggest that there's not really the deliberation happening that we might otherwise want. At the same well, time, after the first presidential debate uh, in 2020, uh, there were more Americans retching on the floor losing their dinner <laughs> than there ever has been. Um, but, but also to your point about Iowa trimming from 12 or 14 to 13 hours, nobody's going after the states on the East Coast that have 10 hours of voting or no absentee voting or, or no early voting. And, and that's where I'm, I'm looking at it. Can't, is it suppression if you're kind of coming closer to the norm, but yeah. you're, you, know, you still have more? Yeah, know, one thing, yeah, that, that, that concept is actually sort of deep-seated in the Voting Rights Act, the concept of what we describe as non-retrogression. And so we can think about retrogression as reducing opportunities. Um, Mm -hmm. And non-retrogression was something put into the Voting Rights Act to say, in 1965, to say states, you know, you sort of opened, you know, the the pitch about some states that were really, uh, you know, really misbehaving in the United States, especially in the South, to say states, you can't change your law unless you can prove that it doesn't ret- create retrogression in terms of voting rights opportunities. But that's a really powerful mechanism. I think about a contrast, you know, I've taught about a contrast between New York and Ohio. New York, which for a long time had zero days of early voting. And Ohio, mm-hmm. after the 2004 election, very contested, went to 35 days of early voting. It then trimmed that back to 28 days and got sued. 
and, and lost originally to say, well, you trimmed back from 35 to 28 days. But courts, they look at the baseline. They look and say, well, you went from 35 to 28, you've restricted opportunities, as opposed to looking at the zero days in New York and saying, right. oh, yeah. so it yeah, is, exactly. it is it's a funny world. It is. And, you know, look, some of the groups that are out there, one of them that's kind of at the epicenter of the, the voter suppression allegations, uh, very insightful, uh, a guy named Mark Elias, who was uh, involved with the Christopher Steele dossier, um, it, you know, now has got this group out there to call Democracy Docket, where he's making a lot of allegations, most of it, which is insightful. Um, and I've you know, been following him and asking, can we see what's in the bill, please? Um, and, you know, every now and then we'll get a link. But um, and maybe not just talking about that particular group and all those others that are saying the talking point about they're defending democracy. What are they alleging and how do those allegations comport with reality? So I've heard fewer voting locations, ID requirements, et cetera. What's really going on there? Yeah, I mean, there is, um, to be frank, a lot of money for lawsuits. <laughs> There's a lot of money for lawsuits in the United States. Yeah. So you can think about the 60 plus lawsuits that were filed by Trump supporters after the election. But, you know, there were hundreds of lawsuits filed in 2020 before the election about changes during the pandemic. And now, you know, anytime, you know, when Texas, you know, enacts a new election law, within hours, there are five or six different groups, each filing lawsuits. So there is just tremendous money sloshing around out there to file these lawsuits and make these allegations. And the concerns are, I think, you know, they're often not looking at, at the totality of the law. They're really picking at a handful of, of provisions of a statute that they think may adversely affect the group that they're suing on behalf of. So if they want to talk about ballot box drop-off locations in Harris mm -hmm. County, Texas, right? If Harris County had, you know, which is, has a lot of Democratic voters and has a lot of racial minority voters, if, if Harris County had provided lots of drop box opportunities and the state of Texas says, we're just going to have one per county, you know, proponents look at that and they're worried and they're saying, I'm not sure, sure that our voters are going to be able to participate as effectively as they were before. Um, so you can say, is it is it suppression because we're now reducing opportunities that they had that are now gone? Or saying we're trying to provide standard uniform practices across the state as opposed to whatever the local election official decides in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and so that's, I think, the crux of these disputes. And really, when it goes to court, it's going to be a question of gathering evidence. How many voters does this affect? What are the alternative avenues available to them? How difficult is it for them to, to use those alternative avenues as opposed to the, the previous opportunities that were available to them? And, and many years ago, I actually lived in Harris County, Texas, in Houston, and the geography is sprawling. Yes. Um, <laughs> it is a very, very big uh, county, and it, there's not very good roads. There's not very many of them. Um, so, yeah, if everybody had to you know, go to downtown Houston, uh, that would be a, a gross uh, inconvenience. Um, and so I, I understand that. Um, but also we've had people that are opposed to um, certain of the pandemic loosening saying that, look, uh, if one group got their way, they could take a, a thousand ballots, collect them and do a drive through in an unmonitored box at 3 a.m. with no form of voter ID on the ballots and then claim, well, Texas closed 750 polling places since 2013. All of this sounds pretty far-fetched to me, um, but I don't know if you've had a, any opportunity to look into those kinds of allegations. Yeah, I mean, I do think, um, you know, we can take it like independent concerns, right? So say, uh, are ballot box locations sufficiently secure, right? And if that's the problem, I think everyone can agree it should be monitored. It should be, you know, we should have particular, uh, you know, safe safety devices that prevent you from taking stuff out of it or... Uh, you know, monitored with with television, or with, with video cameras, you know, those are kinds of one discrete set of concerns. Another set of concerns are like people who round up and collect ballots. So this is often a contested proposition, you know, that, that opponents will describe as ballot harvesting, 
um, proponents will say it's ballot collection, right? To say, listen, you should not give your ballot to someone who's not in your household or a postal worker or some or a county official, because who knows what they do with it? They could destroy it. They could alter it. They could intimidate you. They could pressure you to vote a particular way. And there has been some bipartisan consensus about that in the past, maybe less so today. <laughs> so there are these, these intimidation concerns that have arisen in the past. The flip side are there are people who will point out to those who reside on uh, tribal reservations, Native American reservations, and say the Postal Service is extremely infrequent and difficult to get to. We need to provide opportunities to voters in these extremely rural places or far-flung places with poor mail service and poor road service to be able to go out and service and collect their ballots. So everyone's got a story, right, <laughs> about how we how yeah. we assess and balance these kinds of questions as we as we make the judgments moving forward. Okay. Um you know, another related topic is redistricting and, you know, gerrymandering uh, has been around since the beginning of the Republic. Um, it's really gotten out of hand with the sophisticated census tract information that we have today and, and the micro targeting uh, within a household um, about both parties know which people to spend time on it, which ones not uh, to spend time on. Um, now, our home state of Michigan has a uh, nonpartisan uh, redistricting commission that has been meeting and, you know, moving toward a non-political solution. Uh, it seems to me like a good idea uh, because I see these, you know, congressional districts that snake around like this and, um, you know, that's not bringing together people with commonality other than who they will make the seat secure for. Um, so, are you following redistricting in, as part of your study of the election laws? Yeah, absolutely. And states are experimenting with what you know Michigan is going to do for the first time this year um, about independent redistricting commissions, bipartisan redistricting commissions, whatever it might be, citizens redistricting commissions, trying to take the redistricting process out of the hands of the legislators. Um, and so... There's actually a couple different ways of thinking about the concerns. One is when the legislatures in one state draw congressional districts. I mean, that has a national impact, right? We think about Congress oh, you know, coming yeah. from the 50 states. So people are really concerned about that. But at the same time, it's not as self-interested, right? They're drawing districts for Congress, but they're not drawing their own seats. Um, but the other thing is when state legislators draw their own districts. And that is a funny thing, right? <laughs> think about they get to draw the maps for their own districts about um, who's going to be in competition with whom? Uh, do they put two or three of their political enemies in a place? Do they draw a district that's safe for themselves, whatever it might be? So states have begun experimenting with this. But I, but I have to say, a lot of it really depends on the culture in the state, right? So in Iowa, we've had a legislative services agency that has done a map. It gives it to the legislature for kind of a thumbs up, thumbs down. It's been doing this since 1970. It's worked very well, but in part because of the political culture and climate where everyone thinks this is kind of like a good way forward. In a place like Arizona, where they instituted an independent redistricting commission, Republicans and Democrats have been at loggerheads ever since. And it's just been, it's been nonstop fighting. Many of the decisions have divided the, the, the five-member commission three to two, in part because the fifth member of the commission, who is supposed to be independent, has tended to decide with the Democrats. So it's a question of how you develop the commission in the first place, how bipartisan they are, and then also what rules you put in place, because the commission can do what you guide them to do, but we also have different goals. Like, what do we want in districts? Do we want districts that are competitive or not? California and Arizona actually have different answers to that question about whether or not we should try to, to create competitive districts or whether or not we should ignore that and just draw districts that follow some objective criteria. So it's a, it's a challenge to develop up front, too. It, it is. Um... You know, I know that the city of Austin, Texas, has uh, I think eight or nine uh, congressional districts because they just take a little slice of <laughs> Austin and then balance it out against a uh, a predominantly Republican district, which is uh, is pretty horrible and changes the makeup of Congress. Um, although I don't think using Texas as an example for anything ever does much good. <laughs> that's, that's the way it is. So, what, uh, Derek, what else should we talk about at the state level before we move on to talk a little bit about what's going on at the federal level? Sure, yeah. So I, I think the other thing that, that's been a big uh, concern at the state level, and I think I, I'm kind of waiting to see where it goes, um, 
is a concept that a lot of people in, in my field are calling uh, election subversion or worries about election administrators or election officials in how they administer elections and wondering if they're going to undermine the confidence in elections. So what's happened in 2020, secretaries of state, you know, they, they did a really great job around the country. Democrats, Republicans, you know, I, I, I think some of them, you know, I, I would dispute some of the decisions they made, but all of them at the end of the day, they did their job and they approved the election results and certified results and send them on to Congress and, and to the state legislature. Um, you know, I think the, the question arises when election officials start to reject that process. And we saw you saw a little bit of that in uh, Wayne County <laughs> this, this past year. Um, and there have been some movements in some states to allow the legislature to have a little bit more of a say in the process. This has happened in Georgia to say that you know, maybe the secretary of state shouldn't serve in some of these places to certify election results. I think there's a question moving forward about these election officials who, again, despite the fact that the Republicans or Democrats tend to act in a nonpartisan fashion certifying election results, the question is if there's any inroads in some of these states about election officials who want to reject what the canvas, what the recount, what the audit has indicated and say, no, 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 that wasn't the real result of the election. Um, we have a lot of processes to get to that certification, which is why you saw throughout the country, states just saying, yeah, absolutely. We have all these checks in the process. We affirm the result. I, I worry about the future if there are future election officials who aren't willing to sort of trust that process and undermine the results. So at the federal level, you talked at the top of our uh, chat today about the role between the feds and the uh, states and the Constitution um, and that the Constitution, the federal government does have uh, power to protect states from from bad acts. Um, so there's been a, a partisan bill, uh, HR1, uh, also coded S1, the um, caption, the For the People Act. Um, I've read it. I have uh, a lay understanding of it, but I'm not an expert. So yeah. for our audience on the Common Bridge, can you maybe talk about what you see as some of the major provision uh, you know, what's good, what's bad? Is there anything ugly in there? And and maybe help us understand the actual contents of what this For the People bill has in it. Yeah. Uh, so it's a big bill. <laughs> I mean, it's over 800 pages. Um, and, and to give a little context, right, the, the heart of this bill really was first introduced in Congress in 2019. This was sort of the Democrats' package when they came into, you know, they won the 2018 midterms, they took over Congress. Um, this was sort of their package in, uh, in the House. Um, so it was kind of a, it was symbolic legislation in a sense uh, in 2019, because there was no way the Senate was going to pass it, much less President Trump sign it into law. But, you know, it took on new life in 2021 when they control three branches of government or, or, or you know, the, the, the House, the Senate and the, and the presidency, I should say. Uh, and they're able to, to sort of uh, push it through the House. And, and now it languishes in the Senate pending the filibuster. Um, it has a lot of components. And some of these are cobbled together from acts that have been, um, you know, introduced in Congress since the 70s about how the Federal Election Commission is composed um, to recent concerns, thinking about, uh, you know, paper ballots and, and, and a verified voter trail to ensure that we're able to, to audit elections appropriately. So there's a smorgasbord of things. But, you know, I'll, I'll highlight a couple of things. One is, it, you know, we talked about partisan gerrymandering. It would require states to use independent redistricting commissions of some sort or another for congressional elections. Um, another is that it would require... Uh, expanded absentee voting opportunities in states and expand the opportunities for the collection of ballots, uh, including allowing more ballot harvesting um, and pro uh, prohibit the use of voter identification laws that are being used in the states. Um, it would expand opportunities for ex-felons to participate in elections. Uh, it would require increased disclosure from websites about the advertisers and political advertisements that are provided on the site. Um, you know, it just it's a it, 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 it's a little bit of a who's who of, of running through election law. And undoubtedly, you know, most of these things, I would say, you know, I, I don't want to get into a lot of the wonky legal details. Most of these things are, I think, 
uh, constitutional. They're within Congress's power to dictate the rules of congressional elections. Um, so I think the questions are, you know, is this the policy that we want to set for the country? And to the extent that it overrides state or local control of elections, is that the trade-off we want to make? And so for Democrats in Congress to say, this is an essential thing that we need to do to override those changes. For Republicans, they're saying this undermines a lot of things that we think are safeguards for voter confidence and are not appropriate to manage at the federal level. Well, a, a couple of things you mentioned there that are in my area of expertise with technology, so that uh, the identification of what happens on social platforms, which they call out by name, and you essentially give the popular social media platforms the power of the town square. Okay, I can kind of buy into that. I think that tool used correctly can really be a great place to communicate. But at the same time, people can be kicked off those platforms and told they can't participate. So I'm a little troubled by that. Um, the other major provisions uh, as a data guy that it troubled me is that it kind of seems to flip um, instead of I need to go register to vote in order to be an eligible voter, it says that uh, any, at least this was in the, the House version of HR1, that it took any data that was held by the government, you know, whether it was, you know, uh, public assistance, um, health records, uh, court records, uh, incarceration records, and the like, and made those part of the voter registration role that would then be automatically um, enrolled. And my trouble with that is that in the House bill, it said you couldn't disclose the source of the, uh, that registration. And as a data person, you know, I know the first thing you do, you look at something, you go, does that look right? Yeah. Well, what did it look like in the sending system? Um, the Senate bill has seemed to collect to clean that up a little bit by saying you can't publicly disclose where it came from. Um, and then the mandates for registering 16 year olds was a little puzzling. Um, and then the, you know, the mandates for same day registration yeah. at the same time that the cross check to be sure someone's not registered in two States had to be done six months in advance of the election. I mean, these are the things that caused me pause when I read the bill. Now, again, I'm reading from a lay perspective. If you used to tell me, Hey, you know what? I got it all wrong. That's fine. I'd like well, to have it all wrong. Quite <laughs> so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You, you dug into some provisions that I wasn't as familiar with. Uh, so I'm interested in those, but I, I can say, you know, uh, ideally, you know, on Congress's side, um, the states right now have to essentially enter into deals with one another to cross check when there's a voter who's moved from one state to another, right? That's an awkward system that's happened. So I understand a desire to facilitate some improved national database for this. Um, so again, the systems have improved a lot in the last 20 years. I would say when we talk about voter fraud, double registration is much more difficult to do. Now, it still happens, right? Much more difficult to do nowadays. Um, and so we want to provide some of those cross checks uh, to ensure that, you know, once you're when you register to vote in one state, it's canceled in the last state where you moved from. Um, but, you know, you, you raise, I think, an important point about same day register or, or I should say automatic voter registration, um, which is a popular thing in a lot of states. And, you know, I, I think about this in, in two different ways. The popular reason and I'm not as persuaded about this is while well, we want to reduce barriers, let's automatically register people. And then, you know, it'll be easy for them to participate and show up on election day. Sure. Um, you know, the registration requirement is really not very onerous. I think very few people are turned away, be, you know, at the polling place because they failed to register to vote. Uh, I mean, if you have same day registration, it should be almost nobody, right? Well, right um, exactly. So there's that component. But automatic voter registration does have a virtue. If you want to talk about the data, um, it doesn't require a second set of human inputs into a voter registration base separate and apart from the existing legal database. So if you were to input, you know, a driver's license information and that automatically populates in the voter registration base, that's great because it's one less human error to go from one, you know, from the form into the, into the, into the voter registration base, especially because people look very carefully when they get their driver's license, as opposed to looking very carefully when they get the voter registration form to make sure your name is accurate and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that's helped a little bit in some states, but more and more states are moving toward automatic voter registration as sort of a convenience measure 
know, it's a fact I think yeah. remain to be seen. And, and look, I, I actually think that's great when you have something that's been vetted as well yeah. as a, um, a driver's license is vetted. And I'm a person, you know, that has a, a suffix and, yeah. and such. And I know that if I don't sign my voter uh, ballot or I, when I go in to vote exactly right, did I use my middle initial or did I spell out my middle name? Um, I've been stopped and said this isn't the same person. And I have an unusual last name. And, you know, frankly, as far as a broader uh, issue, and we have this in medical records too, we spend a lot of time trying to identify uh, a unique person. And, you know, given everything that's happened with technology and privacy, you know, probably having a, a national number that's yours for voting, you know, we're not going to be giving up any privacy that we already haven't. And we'd be buying a lot more precision, but you know that's that's a, a rail I don't think anybody wants to touch on. <laughs> I mean, there have been talk about. I mean, national voter national ID card is a different issue, but national voter registration with a, a uniform ID card for everybody has been bandied about. But again, it's the stuff that academics talk about that the politicians definitely treat as a third rail and are not interested in. Republicans okay. never want to nationalize it, and Democrats don't want the ID component. So. Right, right. So, and I look at it, and I did uh, medical systems for a long time, and in every one of those systems, there's a place for a national uh, medical record identifier. Um, and it, the Congress has started to look at some legislation to enable that, to say, you know what, the precision that we would get from knowing that what this person's history is and current medications and such uh, is worth the remaining trade off on the, um, the, the, the privacy. Um, but moving on, the John Lewis Voting Rights um, Advancement Act, uh, what's in it? And, and also, if I can ask two questions at the same time, uh, the bill, the Freedom to Vote bill that just went out last night, I don't know if you got a chance to look at that. Yeah. Uh, any view on either of these two or any education for our, um, our audience? There's a lot. I did have a chance to look at the Freedom for Vote Act uh, that came out oh, today. Good. So I, uh, but um, uh, maybe I'll start with that one. I mean, it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a mere 592 pages. So it's a slimmed down version of of HR one, the For the People Act, um, and it, it it trims out, I think, s- some uh, of the contested provisions, but it leaves in a lot of a, a lot of things. Um, you know, it still has some of the disclosure requirements uh, for websites. Um, it still has the same day registration requirements for the country. Um, it still requires independent redistricting commissions. So I haven't spent a lot of time looking at the things that it specifically pulls out. One of the things that it does say is it says voter identification laws are acceptable in states as long as you have a place where you sign off and say, uh, if you don't have an ID saying, I am who I say I am. So it's what we would describe as a, as a non-strict ID, essentially a you know, affirming that you are who you say you are. It also addresses a couple of things specifically targeting some of the bills we've talked about, Georgia, Texas, Iowa, um, saying, you know, some of these laws try to tighten up penalties for poll workers. It tries to come in and say, these are the limited circumstances. You can remove someone from being a poll worker or an election official. Um, It says you're allowed to distribute food, non-alcoholic beverages outside of polling places. That was something that um, Texas in, or that Georgia in particular was going at. It says it requires every state to put ballot drop boxes, at least one for every 45,000 registered voters. So it provides more drop boxes than just one per county in a very populous county. So it, it has a number of technical provisions targeting some of these practices in a distinctive way. Um, on the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, so this has been built out. There was a version of this that came out in 2019. There have been versions that came out before that. Uh, a new one that came out uh, just a few weeks ago in 2021. Um, and it, it really is trying to build on some of the, the, the concerns that the court has identified um, in a couple of cases, one called Shelby County versus Holder in 2013, another called Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee this year. Um, And without getting too deep in the weeds, what it does is it says Congress is going to look at states that have had recent judicial findings of racial discrimination in voting. And if a state has some recent history of that, 
then it needs to go request a court for approval or the Department of Justice for approval before it makes changes to its election laws in the near future. The notion being we should be skeptical of changes to its election laws to ensure that racial minorities have an opportunity to participate in the political process. And it also targets a handful of practices, voter ID laws, um, changes in redistricting lines, things like that, and says all of these things should be approved by courts in advance to ensure that they don't affect uh, racial minorities. So th- there's a number of other things that the bill does, but I would say those are a couple of highlights that the, the Voting Rights Advancement Act is trying to get at, um, continuing some of the legacy of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 with some some updated twists. Right. And I, I know I actually read the, uh, the Georgia bill, SB 202, and I didn't see anything in there that was that surprising. Now, remember, bear in mind, I didn't know where they started from. Yeah. But, you know, like the provision that you can't give a brochure or uh, tickets or, you know, or a promise of any, you know, anything, including food and beverage, uh, to someone in the voter line within, I think, 150 feet. That was every voting thing I've ever done in Michigan, that there was kind of a, a line, like all yeah. the, you know, partisans were lined up. And then once you cross that line, nobody could talk to you. And then Georgia said, you know, we'll put out a receptacle for water. Um, you know, again, I, I can't speak to what their motivation was, um, but it seemed, you know, better than some of the states in the Northeast and nothing that um, I wasn't familiar with. Um, so, you know, and when they go into court, I don't know if you've looked into it at this level. And I know there was a federal suit that the Justice Department sued Georgia Mm-hmm. Would Georgia's defense be, look, we've give, we've got more you know, early voting days than these other 20 states, or yeah. you know, we've got this provision about what you can give to a person in line, is, it, it's the same as 32 states. Is that a defense for that, or because of Georgia's past practice, that's not considered a defense? Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, how courts examine the evidence. Certainly a comparative perspective is helpful to say we're not an outlier. We are consistent with what other states do. Um, Maybe more importantly is uh, for courts to look at um, how, you know, one thread fits in with the whole tapestry, right? And I think that's an important thing. You know, I kind of opened by talking about all of the opportunities we have to vote You know, I think if you're targeting particular things to say, you know, Georgia prohibiting you from mailing out in advance absentee ballot request forms, you have to make a request for them, you know, changing Dropbox locations and so on. You know, you you can sort of pick at those things, but then it's looking at the bigger picture and saying, how does that fit in with everything else? Um, Should we look at it as, you know, there's 10 voters who it's going to be more difficult for, uh, where they have other opportunities, or we do look at it in sort of the suite of everything altogether. So the, the United States' lawsuit is targeting a different practice. It's saying Georgia acted with racially discriminatory intent. And in a way, you say that's a bold claim, right? To say, well, why would they do, sure. right? But it it helps you avoid some of the effects-based concerns, right? If we're not sure, if it's hard to compare, you know, all that tends to go out the window if you can say, they were just dead set on, you know, targeting racial minorities in the state of Texas or in the state of Georgia with these provisions. And so that, you know, it'll be interesting to see the evidence that comes out, you know, as, as Georgia defends that case and the United States is targeting them in that manner. Great. No, that's, that's a great explanation. Uh, Derek, you've been really generous with your time. And as we think about wrapping up this episode of the common bridge, what did we not cover that perhaps we should be discussing? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, for, for my part, I think it's really hard to look at the United States right now um, and see um, the distrust in elections at, at essentially every level. Um, you know, most recently it's been Republicans, um, but Democrats have had their fair share <laughs> in the not too distant past. Um, it's not a good place to be where if you lose an election, the immediate response is to challenge it, to allege fraud, suppression, whatever it was. Um, and right now, there are a lot of people who can make a lot of money by making those allegations in the United States. And that is just not a good thing. That's not a good place to be. Um, we need to have confident 
voter base intelligently educated to say, you know, this process, I might disagree with it. I might disagree with you, but we have a lot of integrity and oversight in election. Not to say there aren't mistakes and not to say there aren't bad apples, right? And there aren't problems that arise in the system. Um, but for the most part, these there are bipartisan election boards that oversee things, bipartisan watching at polling places, bipartisan canvassing boards that certify election results. And we should feel really confident in those men and women who do their jobs on a daily basis. And, you know, I appreciate programs like this to increase the confidence in the election system by recognizing we can still have debates really at the margins, though. The heart of the election system is strong, but it's only going to be as strong as, as people have that confidence in it and are trying to, to undermine it. Yeah, and, you know, in an era when news was news, not news wasn't entertainment, you know, I think we'd be there. Uh, yeah. But today's actually the day of the uh, California recall election. Right. And, you know, it's going to be a circus um, with uh, uh, hyper sensationalized uh, stories that, Already, the pro recall people are going to say, look, we've gotten um, numerous instances of people being told they had already voted um, and that you have the uh, anti recall group saying, hey, we're not going to accept a suppressed vote. Um, and it's getting pretty ugly out there. Yeah. Um, so so in that light, what action or actions would you recommend that people take today? Uh, what what should they be thinking about and communicating with their friends and neighbors and social media and talking to their elected representatives or, you know, what, and, and perhaps that ties in what might be some of the best or worst policy approaches that we might have today? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such a great question. It's such a hard, <laughs> hard question. Um, I, you know, I think about that's this. That's why part. I asked it. That's why, that's why I got you here and asked the question. <laughs> I mean, I, I start with, you know, whenever you hear of an instance of irregularity or, or, or something suspicious happening in an election place, you know, I think the question is like, can this be caught or stopped or fixed? And, and will that happen by the time we count the ballots? Um, we have provisional ballots are a robust opportunity now developed since Bush versus Gore, a really, really impressive opportunity to, to ensure that if we think there's something coming up that works before election day, we, we have your provisional ballot and we'll count it if it turns out that there was some mistake made elsewhere. So we have that. Mm -hmm. Or a lot of things that somebody somewhere says on social media reporting as an irregularity, maybe is not so irregular at all. <laughs> and maybe it's a totally normal thing in the process. Um, so I always encourage people to sort of take a deep breath, don't hit send and think and wonder if there's an investigation and further inquiry into this. And I've, I've seen a lot of things that are innocent explanations that are mistakes uh, there are mistakes that can be corrected. Um, it's not to say there aren't bad things that happen. <laughs> um, another is, you know, to realize, you know, when you have an election like California's, you're going to have millions and millions of people voting. Um, and inevitably, there's going to be some problems. There's going to be hiccups. Uh, there's going to be wildfires that are, that are slowing people down or a delayed mail service. Um, but for a lot of people who are interested in the day to day, you know, I encourage them, you know, I, I think there was a lot of discussion about election observers in 2020. But I actually encourage people, and I, I approach this with a civic mind and not with a partisan mind, um, be a poll worker. Go work at a polling place for an election. Spend 15 hours from 6 a.m. till 9 p.m. assembling the voting booth, checking in your friends and neighbors, giving them the ballot, and just see how many safeguards there are in the process. There are a lot. I mean, there are a lot out there and many more than there used to be 50 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago. Um, I mean, whenever I've worked elections, it's given me increased confidence in the process because I see all of the steps in the process, the checks designed and double checks designed to ensure that we count all the ballots. We account for all the ballots. We, we account for the people who showed up at the polling place to the number of ballots that end up in the drop box at the end of the day. I've seen people who've done the signature verification checks at absentee polling place, you know, and you, you can have contested questions all day long. But as an observer, you're standing back, peeking over somebody's shoulder. As a worker, you're right there doing it. And so I really encourage if you're interested in all of these nuances and mechanics of the process, just get in there. And, and they're always looking for volunteers. It, it pays dirt. So it's a good opportunity for you to, to participate and see what that looks like.
That is outstanding advice. Uh, we've been talking to Professor Derek Muller of the University of Iowa Law School on a fascinating topic about uh, elections, election law, election integrity, and some really sound practical advice how each of us as individuals can get involved. Um, Professor Muller, before we sign off here, uh, any closing thoughts? Like I said, I think, uh, you know, the fundamentals of the democracy are strong to the extent that we can trust in that process. Um, we do have hyperpolarization right now, which is a product of a lot of things. <laughs> the realignment of the parties in the last 50 years, among other, uh, among other things. But you know, I would really encourage people to, to not get uh, too uh, jaded in the process, to realize that it's a lot of people who are trying their best. Um, and, and, you know, we're all trying to work toward that common goal of, of, of election integrity and sound results. We want to count all the ballots and uh, that, that, that's the objective at the end of the day. So, so show a little, a little grace and humility to those around you as we, uh, as we try to, to fumble through this together. Great. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for uh, agreeing to be on our show. Uh, this is Rich Help, your host of the Common Bridge. The Common Bridge podcast is available on over 30 directories including Apple, Amazon, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and BuzzFeed, Buzzsprout, excuse me, and also on YouTube TV, look up Richard Helpy's Common Bridge. And so until next time, this is Richard Helpy signing off on the Common Bridge. Thank you for watching Richard Helpy's Common Bridge. Please click the subscribe button below. Also, tune into our podcast, Richard Helpy's Common Bridge, on Apple, iHeart, Amazon, and others. Also, be sure to visit us online at richardhelpy.com.